Jim O'Gorman. Pirates two, Baltimore one. If Glass gets another out, you'll see a sight. He's very emotional, and he just might explode out there. There's a strike. Now keep your eyes on him. He pitched a three-hitter at Pittsburgh to beat the Orioles. He's pitched a four-hitter so far today, and he's leading two to one. There's a drive up the middle. Hernandez in back of the bag. He's got him. Jackie Hernandez. Look at Glass. Glass has pitched the Pirates to the World Championship. The Pirates, two games down, have come back and they come to 15 a World, uh, World Series history to win the championship after losing the first two. And Jackie Hernandez, supposedly a weak member of the cast, an erratic shortstop, played brilliantly in this series. Hitting in the National League or any league? No, not all, all the time. But okay, you generally can middle and throw fastballs, 80% of fastballs in a ball game, and especially if he's getting them out. He <laughs> 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 took him out. About seven sliders. I make it talk, I make it talk. Don't, don't stand. World Series. The clamor of the fans equals the glamour of the event. Memorial Stadium, home of the surprising Baltimore Orioles, winners of 102 regular season games, a team that defied the odds makers by overthrowing the world champion New York Yankees, then beating the California Angels in four games to win the American League pennant. After an opening night rainout, the birds and their flock are set to battle the team that calls itself the family. The loose and limber Pittsburgh Pirates, winners of 98 games, the most by a Pittsburgh team in 70 years. But the Bucks' divisional battle with Montreal wasn't settled until the final day. Captain Willie Stargell then steered the Pirate ship to a sweep of Cincinnati in the National League Championship Series. A superb matchup for baseball's 76th World Series. Exclusively from ABC Sports, the 1979 World Series. Live from Memorial Stadium in Baltimore, the Pittsburgh Pirates and the Baltimore Orioles, Game 1. The Pirates sweeping the Reds three straight for the National League Championship, winning 98 games in the regular season. 
Baltimore, taking four games to beat the California Angels for the American League Championship, winning 102 games in the regular season. Game one of the series rained out. A winner like Deluge. Last night, the picture. This morning, it snowed. The 76th World Series matching the Pirates and the Orioles and this ABC Sports exclusive is brought to you by Chevrolet. Like baseball, hot dogs, apple pies, Chevrolet is an American favorite. See the exciting new lineup of 1980 Chevrolets at your Chevy dealer, October 11. And by Atra for closeness with comfort, it's Gillette's best shave. And hello again, everybody. I'm Keith Jackson. It is about 40 degrees as we get ready for game one. Back in 1962, the Yankees and Giants took 13 days to play seven games. The prognosis for the weather for the weekend is not all that good. We may need some extra days to get this one in. These two teams last met 1971. The Pirates won in seven games. The Pirates are making their seventh appearance in the World Series. They have won four times. Baltimore making its fifth appearance in the World Series. The Orioles are two and two. And Incidentally, in this 1979 series, there will be no designated hitter. It's an alternating thing, and this year they play at the National League way. So here's the man-for-man -man comparison, the birds against the bucks at first base. The youthful Eddie Murray, the elder statesman Willie Stodgill. Eddie Murray, the power hitter, don't throw him a fastball, he'll kill you. 99 ribbies, 25 homers. Willie Stodgill, the man who leads the bucks. 32 homers, 82 ribbies. On balance, the edge to Stodgill because of his amazing leadership qualities. At second base, no contest. Bill Garner, the great veteran who can do it all at so many positions. What a clutch hitter he's been for the Bucks. Billy Smith, lesser known, playing because they figure he's a better bet to get a hit off Keeson. A big edge here for Bill Garner of the Bucks. At the shortstop position, another great veteran, Belanger, and Tim Foley. Belanger, who had a hapless year at the plate, but is so remarkable in the field. Foley, who had a truly phenomenal year, did everything the Bucks could have asked of him. One of the most valuable players in the league. The edge, offense, Foley, defense, Belanger. At third base, they're both 29. Doug DeCincy and Bill Matlock. Matlock, good enough to have led the National League in batting twice. And boy, what a clutch hitter he's been. DeCincy, an off year at the plate, but with home run power. But a fielder who's making them think again of Brooks Robinson. So, offense, Matlock, defense, DeCincy. In left field, Johnny Lowenstein and Bill Robinson. Lowenstein, the guy who comes through for you. Those 11 home runs, so many of them in clutch situations. But look at Bill Robinson, 24 homers, 75 RBIs. Again, the edge to the Bucks with Bill Robinson. In center field, two or so alike, catalyst for each ball club, Bumbry and that man, Omar Moreno. Add to those figures, 77 stolen bases. Bumbry with 37. Bumbry, I think the better hitter. On balance, I would give the edge to Al Bumbry because of his experience. Then, in right field, two very great ones, Kenny Singleton and Dave Parker. Singleton in the running for the MVP in the American League, and those figures tell you why. Dave Parker may be the greatest athlete in all of baseball. His figure's excellent, too. But because Parker does so many things, we give the edge to Parker. At the catching position, Rick Dempsey and Steve Nicosia. You don't know much about this kid. His figures are good for his relatively brief service. But you know an awful lot about Rick Dempsey, the most underrated catcher in baseball. Maybe, considered so by some, the best catcher in all of baseball. A huge edge to Dempsey. Thus your man-for-man -man comparison. Interesting, apparently gives the edge to the Bucks. but as all you baseball fans know in a short series, it's pitching that usually prevails. Don Drysdale will have a full analysis of the respective staffs a little bit later.
Right now, I want to talk about the winningest manager in all of baseball. An extraordinary guy, really. That's a cocky Bantam, that Earl Weaver, the manager of the Birds. Over 1,100 wins against 743 losses. You know what he's done as a manager? He's won six Eastern Division titles. He's won four American League pennants, one World Championship. He's a personality. We want you to meet him now, up close and personal. When I was four or five years old and I was watching Dizzy Dean and Pepper Martin and Leo DeRocher and Joe Medwick, I thought that I'd play in the big leagues. And uh, when I was 17 years old, I signed a professional contract with the St. Louis Cardinals. And uh, I failed. I spent 11 years managing in the minor leagues. And uh, once I took that position, all I wanted to be was a good organization man so that I would have a job in baseball. The object of any game, chess, checkers, Monopoly, whatever you might want to play. There has to be a winner in the game. The object is to win, or you can't even start the game. If everybody tried to lose, you'd have no game. In fact, I have to respect all the people in the game that are in a position to have to decide whether it's a win or loss. Uh, umpires are not my enemies, but the fact that I holler at them is right. And the people all over the United States are going to get the impression that he dislikes umpires. It's, that's not true. I do not dislike umpires, but I do holler at them when I feel that one of their decisions have gone against us. I became interested in gardening because being a city boy from St. Louis, I didn't believe that anything just come up out of the ground and grew that you could eat. I can go out in that garden and be able to accomplish something without thinking about it. It doesn't take a lot of thought to scratch the dirt or to cultivate your plants or to put a little fertilizer on it. I really can concentrate my thoughts on baseball more in the garden than I can at the ballpark almost. As far as lifestyle or what I've done, I've been one of the fortunate people who have selected a pro profession that they enjoy and been able to stay in it. I couldn't change anything uh, about my life. However, as far as baseball is concerned, I'm just like anybody else. I second guess myself. And over the course of the years, there's many things that you would have done differently. Fortunately or unfortunately, at one time, uh, Harry Dalton decided to give me a chance to, to manage in the major leagues. And uh, once you take that position, you know, and even in a situation like today, that you're going to be fired. As far as life is concerned, uh, life has been good to me. Uh, I've enjoyed every minute of being in baseball, and uh, I think I'll be happier now that I'm at the age I am, when I can forget about the worries and the problems and just concentrate on either growing tomatoes or playing golf. Two brilliant managers, really brilliant. We've told you about Earl Weaver earlier. Now we want to tell you about Chuck Tanner because he shares with Weaver a key characteristic, the uncanny ability to use the total roster, to pluck just the right man off the bench at the right time to produce. Finally, as you look throughout the series for a hero, don't overlook the little guys. In so many past series, suddenly the most valuable player has been the likes of Bucky Dent, Bobby Richardson, and Billy Martin. Now, the all-important question of the pitching, and who better to analyze the staffs for you than the twin D, Don Drysdale. Thank you very much, Howard. Well, of course, when you're talking about both clubs, you're talking about strong pitching staffs. As a matter of fact, Baltimore, they led the American League in earned run average. Pittsburgh was third in the National League, and that was behind Houston and, of course, Montreal. With the first day off, you're not going to have the off day. Earl Weaver wanted to go with, seven, I'd make that five left-handers throughout the course of this season. But I think right now, with the off day, the strong pitching staff of Baltimore, they have the edge. I think the key is going to be John Candelaria. Baltimore has strong starters. As a matter of fact, when Jim Palmer, he when he was ready to go, they had two starters for every game. Both clubs strong in relief. Stewart, Stoddard, Stanhouse, Martinez, and Stone. Pittsburgh they have Romo Jackson to Colby and of course right now as we look at this game well it's going to be something that's going to really be super if the pitching holds up let's go to Rex Barney the public address announcer for the player introduction.
Your attention, Your attention please. please. Now, ladies, now, and, ladies gentlemen, and gentlemen, it's time it's to meet the two teams who are competing in the 76th World Series. First, the champions of the National League, the Pittsburgh Pirates. Leading off, the National League stolen base leader for the last two years, center fielder Omar Marino. Batting second, the toughest batter to strike out in the National League this year, shortstop Tim Foley. Hitting third, the most valuable player in this year's All-Star game, right fielder Dave Parker. Batting fourth, he hit 24 home runs and drove in 75 runs, left fielder Bill Robinson. The fifth hitter, Pittsburgh's all-time home run leader, the Pirates captain, first baseman, Willie Starjo. In the sixth position, a two-time batting champion, third baseman, Bill Madlock. Hitting seventh, a rookie who hit 288, catcher Steve Nikosia. Hitting eighth, he hit a career high, 293, second baseman, Phil Garner. Batting ninth, and warming up in the bullpen, a pitcher who has won all four of his postseason decisions, right-hander Bruce Keaton. And now the rest of the 1979 champion Pirates. The coaches, Joe Lynette, Al Monchak, Bob Skinner. In the bullpen, Harvey Haddix. The trainer, Tony Bartarone. The rest of the Pirates, infielder, Rennie Stennett. In the bullpen, catcher Ed Ott. Pitcher, Enrique Romo. Outfielder, Lee Lacey. Pitcher, Jim Rooker. Pitcher, Bert Blylevin. Pitcher, Grant Jackson. Outfielder, Mike Easler. Pitcher, Jim Bibby. Pitcher, Kent Tacovey. Outfielder, John Milner. Catcher, Manny Sanguian. Outfielder, Matt Alexander. Pitcher, Don Robinson. Pitcher, John Candelaria. Pitcher, Dave Roberts. The man who led the Pirates to their most victories since 1909, manager Chuck Tanner. And now the American League champion, Sparks the Oriole offense, center fielder Al Bumbray. Batting second, winner of eight gold gloves, shortstop Mark Belanger. Hitting third, Mr. Consistency of the Oriole attack, right fielder Ken. Singleton. Batting cleanup. The Orioles Iron Man and leading here, first baseman, Eddie Murray. In the 
fifth position, his home run, won game one in the championship series, left fielder John Lowenstein. Sixth, the man whose great play Saturday made all of this possible, third baseman Doug Gasinza. Hitting seventh, the versatile switch hitter, second baseman Billy Smith. Batting eighth. 400 hitter in the championship series, catcher Rick Dempsey. Hitting ninth and warming up in the bullpen, the major league's winning as pitcher, left-hander Mike Flanagan. And now the rest of your 1979 champion Orioles. The coaches, Frank Robinson, Ray Miller, Jim Fry. In the bullpen, Elrod Hendricks, Cal Ripken, the trainer, Ralph Salvan, the rest of the Orioles, infielder, Kiko Garcia, catcher, Dave Skaggs, Fielder, Terry Crowley. First baseman, Lee May. Pitcher, Scott McGregor. Outfielder, Pat Kelly. Pitcher, Jim Palmer. Pitcher, Tippy Martinez. Second baseman, Rich Dower. Pitcher, Don Stanhouse. Outfielder, Benny Ayala. Pitcher, Dennis Martinez. Pitcher, Steve Stone. Outfielder, Gary Renneke. Pitcher, Tim Stoddard. Pitcher, Sammy Stewart. And now the man who brought you five American League pennant winners. Presenting the colors for tonight's game is the United States Marine Corps. And now to honor America, our national anthem, which will be sung by Miss Ethel Ennis. stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the rampers we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets Steve! 
packed stadium settles down to their seat. This is World Series Game 1. Between the Pittsburgh Pirates and the Baltimore Orioles, it's 40 degrees and going down. But there's plenty of fever in Baltimore tonight. The pitchers slated for the first game of the 1979 World Series are Sinkaballa, Bruce Keeson of the Bucks, and Southpaw, Mike Flanagan of the Birds. Over 53,000 bird watchers roar as Brooks Robinson, whose brilliance at third won Baltimore its last world title in 1970, throws the first ball to successor Doug DeSensei. Brooks was also there in 71 against these same Pirates who rallied to a seven-game victory. And now in 1979, Bruce Keeson, a Pirate hero as a rookie in the 71 series, faces Baltimore in the bottom of the first. Here's the official 1979 World Series souvenir program, the same one sold at the ballpark, a collector's item commemorating the 76th Fall Classic. Send check or money order for $250 to World Series Program, Box 666, San Francisco, California, 94101. It's filled with World Series glamour, history, and statistics. Send check or money order for $250 to World Series Program, Box 666, San Francisco, California, 94101. The preceding was a message on behalf of Major League Baseball. Your attention, please. May we turn your attention to the commissioner's box near the Orioles dugout for tonight's ceremonial first pitch. The man is familiar to all baseball fans. He holds nearly every Baltimore lifetime hitting record and won 16 gold gloves. Number five, Brooks Robinson. Brooksy delivering the ceremonial first pitch to Doug Desensei, who succeeded him at third base. And yes, he does have a coat with him. <laughs> the field, gratuitously saying, I think, is uh, playable. It's soggy. Here's the starting lineup for the Pittsburgh Pirates, and it's interesting to note that the leadoff man, Omar Moreno, has run off 18 consecutive stolen bases. We'll see what happens first time he's on. Now the defense for the Baltimore Orioles taking the field. It is a night where you need a hand warmer. You've got to keep moving. You've got to keep wiggling around as John Lowenstein goes into the left field position and he's going to be working in one of the soggy areas of the outfield though the turf actually is quite firm. Al Bumbry in center field. Bumbry one of the real flyers defensively in the game of baseball over in right field. He's a horse for this ball club. Big Ken Singleton moving to the inner defense for Baltimore. There's Doug DeSensei who caught the ceremonial first pitch but outstanding in his career here. And of course this man will go down in Baltimore baseball history as one of the greatest ever at shortstop Mark Belanger at second base Earl Weaver going with the percentages puts in the left handed hitting or the right handed hitting uh, Billy Smith in place of left hander Rich Dower. Eddie Murray is over at first base. This is another horse in this ball club. He really is a good one. He plays every day and never is heard from. Behind the plate, Rick Dempsey, you heard of the pregame program. Howard suggests that he may be one of the best catchers in all of baseball. And out on the mound, the young left-hander from New Hampshire, Mike Flanagan, who was 23-9 and nine on the regular season. He won a ball game in the playoff series against the California Angels. He's very steady, and he's become an outstanding pitcher. The umpires for the ball game tonight, Jerry Newdecker out of the American League is back at the plate. Bob Engel of the National League at first. Rutch Getz of the American League at second. Terry Taylor, National League at third. Down the left field line, Jim McKean, American League, and Paul Runge is down the right field line from the National League. 
The dimensions for this ballpark is relatively short. Down the lines, as you can see, at 309 feet, there is a lot of room out in center at 405, and those are the distances up the alleys. They do play on natural grass here, and they have played some five football games already, and they'll have another one scheduled for this coming Sunday. So we'll see what it's like when we come back here. The prognosis for the weather is more bad weather coming in as of Friday. Omar Marino, the numbers on the year for him in the championship series for the National League title, he was three for 12, and he stole one base. Out on the mound, the left-hander Mike Flanagan, because of the bad weather last night, he went out and threw easy for five minutes when the game was officially called. Jim Palmer out with him through for a while himself. So here's the first pitch of the 1979 World Series. And it's fouled away. Aki, I think one of the big thing right now is that you've got to try and, as I said before, neutralize this left-handed power of the Pirates. And it's going to be up to the left-handers, Flanagan, and, of course, Scott McGregor to do just that. You got to keep this guy off the base. He's like Bumbry. He'll make things happen. The pitch bounces outside and it, it'll go back into the bag or be nope. They keep it in play. Rick Dempsey back of the plate will be tested. I am sure early by Moreno because they want to know how they can handle it. Dempsey on the other hand says Chuck Tanner's baseball teams in his career have only stolen one base off of him. And Flanagan comes high and tight to Marino and the count goes now to two and one. You can keep the ball in on Marino. You keep it in with hard stuff and he'll, he likes the ball out over the plate. He likes to spray the ball around if he possibly can. You have the defense for Baltimore. You see Bumbry a little bit in left center field. It is now three and one. And Flanagan trying to keep that ball in on him. He doesn't like to get that ball out to where he can get the big head of the bat on it. He's got excellent speed and you don't play him too deep. He doesn't have a lot of power on the year. Well, he hit eight home runs. Desense on the edge of the grass at third, three and one pitch. It's beat on the ground to the right side for Billy Smith, the second baseman. There's your first out. But you can see how quick that Marino gets down that line. He made high it close. Close. Yep. But the key task to keep him off the bases, and Flanagan was equal to it. Tim Foley, Chuck Tanner says, is the man that brought it all together for his ball club. He was the last piece in the puzzle for them. You see Frank Robinson may be the most active of all big league coaches positioning his outfielders. We have turned the outfield over to him. Flanagan hits the corner to make it one and one. Last year, and Jim Palmer was very forthright about it, the Baltimore outfielders were a sorry lot defensively. Pull the string on the change, and he gets him out in front. He fouls it away to make it one and two, and the change is a pitch that Mike Flanagan picked up from Scott McGregor in the middle of the season, and it's made a tremendous difference in the way he's been working on the mound. That ball is popped up out into left field, drifting toward Lowenstein. John makes the catch, still two out. Fastballs being clocked on the first two batters down at 91 and 92 miles per hour. He's sneaky fast. He's got a good fastball and he keeps it away from the right hand hitters and into the left handers. It will tail and sink for him. He keeps a hard slider curveball in on him to keep him off balance. And then he's come up with that good change, which makes it That's a little what more made him. That's Winning right. 19 a year ago, 23 this year, he studied Scott McGregor, who is known for his pitching. Guile and who has the great changeup, and very quickly Flanagan duplicated McGregor. Let's see what he can do with Dave Parker. Parker hits a bullet down the right field side. It's going to the corner for a base hit, and the big guy pumping for second, stumbling as he goes around first base, but he's all right. He reaches back and grabs the back of his right leg. Now right there, the first test, gentlemen, for Mike Flanagan against the Bucks' left-hand power. Much has been made of left-handers stopping, as you look at it in replay, the Bucks' left-hand power. Well, on the season, Dave Parker, for instance, who can hit anybody, hit 13 home runs against southpaws and 12 against right-handers. Stodgell, when he's hitting, can hit anybody. Yeah, that's exactly the truth, Howard. And of course, the big thing right now, Tony Bonnerell is going to go out. I don't know whether it was Parker might have pulled a hamstring or something as he went around that bag at first. You pointed it out, Keith, that he did stumble going around the bag. 
He tried to get the fastball in on him, and I believe Parker just looking fastball all the way. If you're a hitter, you'll go up there at times and watch the way that pitcher will try and work right off the bat to your opposing uh, hitters, or actually your own teammates. And of course, these guys aren't dumb. They know their own strengths and they own they own their own weaknesses. And of course, when you know that you're scouted as much as these two clubs have been scouted, you got to figure that somewhere along the line they are going to try and hit a point of weakness. Bill Robinson is at the plate, 262 hitter, 0 for 3 in the playoff series. And Flanagan's fastball comes in for strike one. Flanagan during the last season and a half has improved his move on the mound. He has become very proficient at holding base runners. He picked off eight this past season. That's fouled away. He's in front two as he pulled the string. He has developed confidence in that change and he throws it a lot. That's really made him a good pitcher. You know since June 8th of this year Flanagan finished the season 17 wins and five losses and well, if you're going to finish strong that's the way to finish it. Well, that's the key point. That's when he started using that changeup, developing confidence in it, because he said he had been throwing the fastball and the curve exclusively in the early going, and he hadn't been winning the way his talent would have dictated. Struck him out. So the top half of the first inning is over. Pittsburgh leaves Dave Parker standing at second base. And Flanagan strikes out Robinson. So after one half inning of play, Pittsburgh nothing, Baltimore coming to bat. Game one, 1979 World Series. The batting order for the Baltimore Orioles, Bumbrey, Belanger, Singleton, Murray, Lowenstein, Desensei, Smith, Dempsey, Flanagan, Smith, and Lowenstein representing percentage baseball to get the left-handers in the lineup against the right-handed pitcher. The defense for Pittsburgh, Robinson, Moreno, Parker in the outfield, Madlock, Foley, Garner, Stargell on the inside, Nicosia back of the plate, Bruce Keeson is on the mound. And the most impressive thing to me in Bruce Keeson's professional baseball record with the Pittsburgh Pirates, in his career, he's 27 and 7 in the months of September and October. It's astonishing, isn't it? You talk to him about it, he said, I don't know why, but somehow my stuff seems to work better in the cold weather. I'm not arguing with it anymore, I'm just accepting it. <laughs> He's going to find out tonight because it is chilly here. I think one of the big keys to watch tonight is how many times that a pitcher will be allowed to go up. It's very cold. And a lot of times the umpire will allow them to just go up and blow on their hand a little bit. They have given him permission to do that tonight. And I would have to think that it's proper because it is chilly. What would you say it was 41 degrees and it is going down rapidly. That was an hour ago. I suspect it's cooler <laughs> than that now. So here's Bumbry. Now at 285, four for 16 against the Angels. He strokes at the left field. It's going to drop for a base hit. And it drops and rolls rather well. So the outfield turf is firm. Well, there's the same kind of guy. They come out of the same chapter, Moreno and Bumbry, and you got to try and keep both of those guys off the bases. Moreno was 77 stolen bases on the year, but Al Bumbry had 37 of his own. Weaver, as you look at this hit again, Bumbry going right with the pitch, dropping it into short left center field for the single. Weaver likes to run Bumbry immediately when Belanger bats second because Mark is a good hit and run man despite the hapless batting average and he makes decent contact. He'll get into a point where he'll move him as you say hard on the hit and run or sometimes even in the first inning by or whenever Bumbry's on and Belanger comes up they go to the sacrifice. Keeson's first pitch is low for ball one and of course Weaver is a good manager in this point you see Belanger checking with Cal Ripken his third base coach when Weaver gets ahead on the count all of a sudden that's when he will start to make things happen and now this is what the pitchers are going to have to watch out for tonight it is still wet over by their dugout the infield has been covered as you look at Earl Weaver but they pick up that mud in their spikes walking back and forth to the mound and they got to make sure that they are clean before every pitch. Bumbrick coming off first. And the pitch is high and tight to Belanger, who has a sore lower left leg. In September, he had a foul ball, which broke a blood vessel. Before the championship series, they lanced the leg, drained it. During the playoffs, he wore that shin guard, and he is still wearing it. 
but what a magician he is out there defensively. My goodness. Keeson misses just inside. And the count now, three balls and no strikes. And let's see what Earl Weaver decides to do. He walked in. They play the first two games of the series here, then they move to Pittsburgh, and Willie Stargell, who is the unquestioned leader of this ball club, goes to the mound with a company word. For the 29-year-old right-hander, born and raised in Pasco, Washington, now living in Turtle Creek, Pennsylvania, became quite famous after the 1971 series when he left the ballpark instantly by helicopter to fly to Pittsburgh to get married. He also became a national sports personality by pitching six and a third innings in the fourth game to beat Baltimore. Kenny Singleton is at the plate now. He was six for 16 in the championship series. The gut he to, represents power. He got to the winning very late, Keith, but his wife waited. <laughs> and the pitch is low inside. Now, Keeson, in contrast to Flanagan, who went out and threw yesterday, Harvey Haddox, the Bucks pitching coach, said Keeson did not throw either last night or earlier today. Question is, is he loose? The 2 2 pitch to Ken Singleton. Nobody out, two runners aboard. It's up the middle, knocked down by Keeson. He lost his double play when he didn't come up cleanly with it, but he gets Singleton at first base. The base runner is Bumbry at third now, Belanger at second. It's going to be interesting to see just how big that play right there could be in this entire ballgame. Well, when you've got Eddie Murray coming at you, Don, you know the cardinal rules. Stay away from the fastball. The guy will kill you. Hit it out of sight. But you can't always get location on the other stuff. Well, here's a case here. Depending on how Keeson feels and how Nikosia feels about his control, now he hasn't been real sharp yet. You've still got first base open. Willie right. Stargell looking in the dugout. Would you rather pitch to Murray or would you rather go to the even the left hand hitter Johnny Lowenstein. The figures to pitch to him carefully. Pitches inside. Ball one. One out. Ball to the outfield. Or a base hit obviously to bring home the first one of the game. That's where you've got to try and keep the ball on Eddie Murray. You move the fastball in sliders in and then you can tail the fastball down and away from him. He'll have a chance to pull off of it. Ball two, low. Jason working carefully. Went outside that time, and they're doing just exactly what you suggested, Don. I just can't see any reason right here to let Eddie Murray hurt you, even though it's only the first inning. But you've got a man coming up that, although Johnny Lowenstein's had a fine year for Baltimore, I got to go to Lowenstein instead of Murray. And Weaver aware of that Adam swinging on the three and old pitch. That's right. He green lighted him. And I'll tell you Keeson did not take anything off of it either. Walked it. Leadoff man Al Bumbry, one of many Orioles who turned on the fans during the season, turns them on once again. Oh, 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 oh. With the decibel level rising, the birds pose the first threat, loading the bases with only one out. Here's Lowenstein. I think one of the key tributes that Earl Weaver has made to three players on this Baltimore ball club, and here's one of them, Johnny Lowenstein. The other is Terry Crowley. The other is Benny Ayala. He says, you know, everybody wants to play, but he says, I can't play everybody all the time, but he says, I've got three vet veterans on this ball club that don't gripe about anything. I platoon them, I'll put them in here, I'll put them in there. They're all up in age, but they all do the job. Pitch is low. Ball one. Make and sleeves say but tonight <laughs> let it be Lowenstein. <laughs> he was born in Wolf Point, Montana. He lives now in Las Vegas. Went to school at UC Riverside Anthropology. Ball is hit on the ground to the second baseman Garner. Throws it away. Two run score.
John Lowenstein, ace utility man, wraps a double play ball to Phil Garner, but no double play here. Two Orioles score, and the birds are off and winning. They had the table set. They had every card stacked perfectly. And the ball was hit to Garner. He had trouble right off the bat getting the ball out of his glove. As he sees, he turns, and now he can't find the handle. Now when he throws it, it's way away from Foley, who actually committed himself too early. Now the ball is out in left field. Two runs score. Runners at the corners. And Pittsburgh in trouble here in the first. We called it on the button, Donald, because that ball slipped up his glove and he had trouble corralling it and then threw hurriedly and errantly. Doug Desensei comes up now with Murray over at third and Lowenstein at first. Two runs are in, one RBI involved. Bumbry coming home is an RBI, the other run scoring on the error. The numbers on Desensei for the year. He was four for 13, however, against the Angels in the championship series. He is better than a 230 hitter. It was an off year for him, but he still retained that occasional home run power with 16 of them. Notable in the American League for his ability to hit Ron Guidry. Jim Rooker is now up and throwing in the bullpen for the Pittsburgh Pirates as Keeson almost got out of the jam. Almost. There's Rooker, left handed. So if Tanner's going to have to make a move early, he's going to make the move, which could force Weaver to make some changes in his batting order. First pitch, low and away. That's Eddie Murray at third. At first, is Johnny Lowenstein. Well, Earl Weaver will go right around with Chuck Tanner. I mean, you can tell, you can put on one sleeve at a time with both of them because that's, they will match one another. That's right. That's the key characteristic of both men use of the total roster. The pitch is high. I think also in all due fairness and there is the staff of Pittsburgh guys Willie Starger will go in with Nicosia and Keeson and try and just settle things down a little bit and I'll do fairness to Doug DeSensei he had a bad back at the early part of the year heard it in infield practice and he missed quite a few games so he's been fighting that problem but as you said Howard he is such a better hitter than 230 and what a play he made in the championship series he might have just got Baltimore right here on Anderson on Jimmy Anderson that's right I don't know where Baltimore finds it but they come up with some guys at third base don't they the goal. two balls no strikes the count crowd yelling balk which it was not no, it was not. And of course, Baltimore, they have seen that play right there as he faked the third while the runner at first, Lowenstein, was walking back to the bag. He wasn't going to get caught. Ball bounces away from Nicosia. Murray comes to the plate. It's 3 0 Baltimore. Mistakes by the Pirates hurting them here in the bottom of the first inning. The very thing the Pirates have not been doing until this inning. Well, here's a ball down in the dirt. Nikoja tries to make the play on the ball, and it's just such a bad pitch that he cannot get down there. That ball hitting and then bouncing off his right shin guard and going back over towards the Baltimore dugout. No chance to get Murray coming home, and Lowenstein stands at second. That's a wild pitch. Early in the year, the Bucks had a facility for beating themselves. They started poorly, as has so often been there, won't. But if ever a team put it together, the Bucks did in their sweep of the Reds. There's a strike to the sensei. It's three and one now. Three nothing. A single by Bumbry. A walk. Then you had the ground out. Then you had another walk. You had the error on Garner. Now you've got a wild pitch. You've got three runs in. And there's a high drive. Hit the left field. Going way yeah, it's, back. Gone. it's gone. Forget it. That, ladies and gentlemen, is Doug DeSensei with that. No longer so occasional home run power. And the birds are off to a big start. As a sign says here in the ballpark, the bird will fly. Now, Doug DeSense, he can hit him as far as anybody. And of course, he's ahead on the count. And you talk about these things. He's looking fastball all the way up over the plate. And believe me, I can tell you from past experience, there's nothing that goes further than a high sinker. <laughs> and no.
no one can stop Keeson's wild pitch. The Orioles lead three to nothing to the merriment of this wild flock of fans. Captain Willie Stardew wants no more miscues and tells his mates to relax. But Doug DeSensei doesn't give them a chance to relax. Sailing Keeson's offering deep into a big black sky. The Sensei's two-run homer not only lifts the volume still higher, but threatens to turn game one into a roaring round. Five Oriole runs in the first inning of the first game also sets a World Series record. It is 5-0 Baltimore in the bottom of the first inning. And the batter is Billy Smith, the second baseman. Remember this Baltimore team had more than 180 home runs as a team. More than in the Frank Robinson, Boog Powell, Brooks Robinson era. Two balls and no strikes and Doug DeSensei. That's nailing a home run, the 15th player to do it in his first trip to the plate. That stroke down into the right field area. Skids in for a base hit. Parker slips, almost falls down, but gets the throw back in. So Smith is on with a single. And once again, the change in the lineup by Weaver pays off. Tanner goes to the mound. We'll see Rooker, I suspect, rather shortly. He's already pointed to the bullpen, and Jim Rooker is coming on. You talked earlier, Keith, about Keeson not throwing either last night or early today. Yep. Keeson came to Haddocks this morning and said if the Pirates had other plans about another starter, he'd be agreeable. Ha Haddock said you're still our pitcher, but makes you wonder about his confidence, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Time is out. We'll be right back. You had the arrow on Garner. Now you've got a wild pitch. You've got three runs in, and there's a high drive. Hit the left field, going way yeah, back. Gone. It's gone. Forget it. The grounds crew out there replacing turf, putting down some sand, and trying to repair the area that Dave Parker tore up when he came over to field that line single by Billy Smith. You see his feet go out from under him there, and with the feet went the turf, leaving some big holes, so they are fixing it now, as Jim Rooker, with a record of four and seven, comes in in relief of Bruce Keeson, who is not able to get out of the first inning. Well, what they're actually doing in the outfield, they're taking towels and going out and they're trying to sop up some of the water. They'll take the towels, they'll stamp on them, and then they'll go squeeze them into the bucket. Boy, it, I, it's just amazing that they got this game in tonight. When I woke up this morning and looked out the window, oh, like somebody sorry. mentioned, they said they thought they overslept because it was snowing out. There he is, the starting pitcher for the Birds tomorrow. One of the greatest pitchers of his time, Jim Palmer, with 225 career victories. Rooker at 37 years of age, Lakeview, Oregon, now living in Library, Pennsylvania. Came over from Kansas City. Gene Garber back in 1972. In 1977, he was 14 and 9, originally signed as an outfielder. So he gets the call early as Pittsburgh defensive mistakes send Bruce Keeson out of the ball game very early. Keeson going one third of an inning. You still only have one out. Rick Dipsy now comes to the plate with a pitcher, Mike Flanagan, standing on deck and five big runs across the plate. Line to the shortstop Foley. Throw to first base. Throws it away. Billy Smith's going to go to second. Stargell overruns the ball and Smith's in there. You've got two out. And that oh. ball was hit like a shot and the box, as you can see, are very rattled. Now this ball hit hard. Now Timmy has a chance at Billy Smith at first base. All he's got to do is make a decent throw. But the throw is away from Stargell. He can't make the play. Smith was hesitant about going to second base. If Stargell plays the carom and plays it cleanly, he's got a chance to throw him out at second base. So that is the second Pittsburgh air here in the first inning. Plus one of 
omission. That's right. Well, here's Flanagan's first at bat in a long time. <laughs> Once hit three home runs when he was playing at the University of Massachusetts against Maine in one game. Yeah. Got his name on his own bat, too, I'll have you know. That's a lovely lady. That's Mike Flanagan's wife. Tap around in front. Nikos is going to hurry. In time. And so, the first inning is finally over. But what an inning for Baltimore as they take the lead five to nothing. Mike Flanagan will pitch to Willie Stargell, Bill Madlock, and Steve Nicosia. Before the ball game, Howard Cosell talked with the Baltimore lefty. Mike, explain why you became an even better pitcher this year than you were a year ago. How and when it happened? Well, I think uh, early in the year I was having trouble with my curveball, and that has been my main pitch uh, all of last year. And uh, I kind of decided I'd better do something quick because I was getting knocked out of some of the games early. So I worked with Scotty McGregor on his changeup and a slider. And I think I what put me over the hump was the changeup, and it made me a four-pitch pitcher instead of a two-pitch pitcher. That's hard to say. Two-pitch pitcher, four-pitch pitcher. He said it very well. He's a dandy pitcher, however you want to put it. But you were talking a moment ago and mentioning the fact that he had the Angels down nine to one. And That's right. Him. Key point. Bucks like the Angels can come back. Willie Stargell represents the lumber portion in the Pirate lineup. They call Parker Lightning and Stargell Lumber. And it's probably the loosest bunch of guys I've ever seen in a baseball clubhouse. They do enjoy themselves and they are very dangerous when they take the offense. The wives of the Baltimore Orioles seated there. There's the pretty lady. Married to Doug DeCense. They were having dinner in Little Italy down here two nights ago, and Doogie was mobbed by about 50 kids as he came out of the restaurant. Stood there and signed for every one of them. So here's Willie. Five for 11 in the championship series. And the first pitch from Mike Flanagan is high and inside for ball one. Can't be overemphasized that this man is one of the most remarkable men in American sport. Well, I'll tell you something. If the pitch is in for a strike one and one, you'd like Willis Stargell no matter what he did. Exactly. He is a great human being off the field. His work with sickle cell anemia a lesson. Change and Willis waving and it's one and two. A lesson in humanity. And his feeling for his fellow man. You could just look at the glove of Dempsey right there. That tells you the book on Stargell, a good low ball hitter. Dempsey, he almost had to come out of a crouch and stand up to get that target up high enough on Stargell. Well, he sewed up the pennant clincher, golfing a low one at three rivers. He goes again for the change up and misses and strikes out. That's the second strikeout by Flanagan. Good breaking pitch right here. It took just a little bit off. Stargell, you see, way out in front and in an excellent location. The batter is Bill Madlock, who is also one of the pieces to the puzzle that fit perfectly. If you look at their record, he may have been the key piece. I'll develop that in a second, Keith. All right, now's the time to do it. Before Matlock joined the Bucks, they had won 37 and lost 34. After Matlock came, the Bucks won 61 and lost 30. What a difference. Came from the Giants. High foul back in the crowd. That's souvenir number three. By the way, that five runs in the first inning is a World Series record. Sharp shot, third base to Sensei. How cold to the fingers? Not for Doug. Two down. Doogie is reminding them of Brooks Robinson. Said it was the proudest moment of his life as you look at him again. Had a, just a fractional instant of trouble with it, but plenty of time for the throw on the right handed hitter. Said it gave him his greatest joy after that play against Anderson, Don, in the game you called when they likened them after the game to Brooks. Here's one of the finest plays I've ever seen, Howard. 
Steve Nicosia, the Pittsburgh catcher, hits it on the ground, backhanded nicely by Billy Smith. And so Mike Flanagan gets the Pirates in order in the top of the second inning. And after one and a half in Baltimore, the Orioles lead it by a score of five to nothing. And this was a good defensive play by Smith as he took his time with it. Threw him out. So after one and a half, with the temperature getting down into the 30s now, Baltimore leads it 5 zip. <laughs> I agree. But it's the World Series, and it's been played in snow and rain for all the years. 26 times there have been games postponed, but once the bell rings, the weather is forgotten. Al Bumby now will lead it off for Baltimore in the bottom of the second inning. Belanger Singleton will follow. It'll be the top of the order. The Orioles batted around. The umpires are now coming in to have a conversation with Jerry Newdecker. Well, it's the right field umpire, and that is Paul Rungi coming in, and he's telling, I believe, Jerry Newdecker, saying, hey, I believe we need some help out there. They've been working out in left field. We need some help out in right field. I believe that Parker might have complained a little bit. We saw the play before back in the first inning where Parker slipped on that ball and he might be telling him say look at let's get these guys ready to go out here in right field a little bit in between innings. All right Paul's ready so is Al Bumbrey step again with Belanger moving to the on deck circle and Jim Rooker who relieved Keeson the book on Keeson incidentally one third of an inning four earned runs three hits. Struck out nobody and walked two, and the first pitch to Bumbrey is strike one. This is the kind of fellow who is not only the catalyst of the club, as Don stated, but he is a good, solid hitter. He, he'll get you key hits with key ribbies. We had him here in a Monday night game during the year when he got the big hit with an opposite field home run. Remember? That's right. Fouls it back. This will neutralize him just a little bit. I Left didn't think you could get up from under the table like that. <laughs> Told you, I'm used to ducking those. Chops it back to the mound. Pitcher Rooker throws him out. So Jim gets a little easier start than did the starter, Keeson. Belanger up, he walked in the first inning. And that walk was a Keeson mistake. You mentioned his failure to handle Singleton's ball cleanly to execute or start the double play. But the walk to Mark immediately had Bumbrey in scoring position. Rooker quick on the outside corner with a fastball. Strike one. Strike two. Good breaking pitch that time, right down on the knees of Belanger. It was a beauty. He's gone. Belanger looks at strike three. You know the thing that have you make make you feel awful bad as you look at this next pitch by Rooker and he came back with another dandy curveball. Belanger started couldn't pull the trigger and in a good location. But I was going to say the thing that have to make you feel awfully bad is if you went through that whole season and never had a star. Just hold the door for <laughs> Willie. That's about it. Hold the door for everybody. <laughs> Kenny Singleton. Out pitcher to first, his first time up. Switch hitter goes to the right side against the left hander, and Rooker misses outside for ball one. Two out, nobody on. He's a different player this year from a year ago. So confident because he's got his strength back. After two seasons ago, he underwent shoulder surgery, and he felt almost helpless trying to throw from right field last year. That was part of why. The Orioles outfield last year was a relatively sorry lot defensively. It's a big swing. You saw that uh, statistic offered on your screen there that he's been very productive when Mike Flanagan has been on the mound. And to talk about the arm from right field in 1979, he had eight assists. He only had one in 1978. So that's testimony to the strength of the arm as well. That's rolled and it's fair. And Madlock makes a fine play. And they don't get him. The throws in the dirt. We've got a call out ahead, though. We'll be hearing from Kenny Singleton in just a couple of minutes, and you'll hear him explaining how he became a new man. 
This is a good play by Madlock to get over to the ball and then all of a sudden his momentum carries him across. He doesn't get real good footing and then the throw a little bit shallow Singleton with a slide. I don't know whether he comes up with that ball. Here we look at it again. Makes a good play but not going away from the bag. That's a tough play for any third baseman. Well he wasn't playing the line. Sometimes a guy plays the line when you don't expect him to be playing the line and that's what the sensei was doing on the hit by Anderson. Exactly he was right. playing the line. There was no reason for Matlock to be playing the line on that occasion. Not right now. Not protecting against an extra base hit. Eddie Murray also turns and goes to the other side of the plate against the left hander, and Rooker is outside for ball one. Keith, he's got power both ways, believe me. And he's about the same type hitter both ways. Lowenstein on deck, two out. Singleton at first. Hit the center, base hit. Ball gets out to center field in a hurry. Really skips to the outfield out in that area. He's in good shape. Well, that was it. The low fastball, and he hit a rocket. Look at that record against Baltimore. Not very impressive, is it? He was with the Royals at the time, of course. And. Lowenstein, Lowenstein, forgive me, Keith, stays in there. With a 5 0 lead, why not? Well, it's still very early. Of course, if you go to make your defensive changes right now, well, Pittsburgh's got seven more whacks at you, and you can't count them out. They can play catch up in a hurry. Two on, two out. As Lowenstein stands in, swings and misses, and a breaking pitch for strike one. If this was, say, maybe the seventh inning, sixth inning, seventh inning right there, why Earl Weaver, in all probability, would go to Gary Renicky. Maybe, but with a 5 nothing lead. Not right now, not in the second inning. Never. John checks on it, cost him one and two. Thirty-seven-year-old Jim Rooker blows the fastball in there, and Lowenstein strikes out. So Baltimore doesn't go down easy in the second, but they do hold them, and the Orioles lead it five to nothing. This is the bench. Every ball player spends at least half his career right here, working on equipment, going over the hitters, or just relaxing. And when I relax, I reach for Copenhagen, the smokeless tobacco. Just a pinch between my cheek and gum gives me rich tobacco flavor without lighting up or tying up my hands. So try Copenhagen, or for you fellas just starting out, mild happy days, tobaccos you enjoy without lighting up. See you, Bench. There's Kenny Singleton. We told you he had become a new man, and he had explained how. Here's my talk with him. You're a new person in the outfield. Explain why. Well, this year I have more confidence. Uh, last year, uh, I didn't really want the ball hit to me because I couldn't really throw it back the way I wanted to. This year, I really feel good in the outfield. Uh, I've been throwing the ball well all year, all season long, and uh, you know the runners seem to be stopping this year. They don't try and keep going anymore. This relates to your off-season surgery. Uh, yes, uh, two years ago. Last year was a different story. Everybody who got on first couldn't wait to get go to third base on it. This year, they seem to be holding up quite a bit. Three game comments of Kenny Singleton Phil Garner the Pirate second baseman is the batter strike one on him the pitcher Rooker is scheduled to come next and then the top of the order Moreno and that's fouled high up in the air and drifting back into the crowd. This is a pepper pot ball player this Phil Garner and talk about clutch play at 377 during the month of September with some key home runs. There's a pitch right there that is a bread and butter pitch for Mike Flanagan. That hard slider or breaking pitch right down on the inside corner of those right hand hitters. They have a tendency to give up on it. That's three strikeouts now for Mike. Here's Jim Rooker coming to the plate. Oh, look at this. Rooker lays it down. Flanagan makes the play. Giving. Trying to get it down toward third base, and I think if he'd been able to roll it more down the line, I don't think the Sins had gotten him. I don't believe so. If he'd have got it down the line, you're exactly right, because he got it actually between the line and the pitcher's mound. World Series history on the Pittsburgh Pirates. 
see that they lost 1903. That was really not the Red Sox. It's what it's the franchise that became the Red Sox. They called them Boston Pilgrims back in those days. That's <laughs> a new fan. Uh, yeah, my blanket, huh? <laughs> Pretty well behaved dog to endure all this noise and be so passive about it. Omar Moreno coming up now, rolled out to the second baseman first time up. Let's see if he gets on. It's going to be interesting to see what he does first time he's on, but they are down 5 nothing. So he can't be as ambitious, perhaps, as he might like to be. The sensei is in on the grass now. He's not going to give Moreno as much room down that line as he did Rooker. And Moreno chucks it. And then the ball sails gently out into center field. And the catch made by Bumbry to end the top of the third inning. So after two and a half innings of play in game one of the 79 World Series, it's 5 0 Baltimore. That's Dave Park, our highest paid player in baseball. And that fact militated against him early this season. Our conversation explains why and what happened. You seem much more at peace with yourself than I think I've ever seen you because you were troubled even when you got the huge contract you were shocked by some of the letters you received some of the public reaction that was so adverse you've settled down now haven't you yes I have I think I really had to, to battle with myself to just realize that hey you know with all the things that's taking place uh, uh, with the contract that, that came along with it was uh, the people breaking in my house vandalizing my home of course they vandalized my car a few times but I just finally put it in a proper perspective well, baseball is my life this is what I, I got to do for a living and uh, hey without baseball I wouldn't be where I am today so I just kind of push everything else to the side and say well hey when I'm on the field I'm in my own world can't nobody mess with me here and I think it took about a half a season for me to get that together but I did have quite a few things to sidetrack me from my concentration towards the gang and I just fought to to get that back and just realize when I'm on the field that I'm in my world and can't nobody bother me out here. It's a terrible thing when you are penalized for being successful but he's got it in perspective and Zach of a player. Doug DeSensei is up there. You know Brooks Robinson hit a home run in his first at bat the 1966 series. The man who has succeeded him now has hit a home run in the first at bat. Well we're happy to be here. Just glad the snow didn't stick. Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> that was the series when they belted the Dodgers. Yes. Four games in a row and Kurt Bleffery made a catch here. The Dodgers still don't believe. Right Donald? That's right, and I know who he hit the first home run off of. <laughs> <laughs> the sensei at the plate, the pitch is low, it's ball one. <laughs> Billy Smith's on deck, and Rick Dempsey will follow. You were talking about Baltimore setting a first inning record in a first game. I thought they broke that off. I thought they scored more than that off me. <laughs> five nothing, Baltimore leading with five big ones in the first. The crowd out there in the Bleachers in left field yelling hit another one Dougie and the pitch is in there for a strike it's one and one. Pretty good pitch. Yes it was he has Doogie leaning and he tried to bring it from the outside in tried to bring a breaking pitch out there and he just did miss. Count is full at three and two on to sensei. He's another California. A lot of those fellas in baseball good reason for it the weather out there enabling the youngsters to play year round and they develop it. So the sensei gets a free pass to first base from Rooker. Billy Smith comes up now and Smith had a single in his first trip tonight. You know, Keith one of the things I'm sure that had to enter Earl Weaver's mind in changing his lineup just a little bit and putting Billy Smith in at second base instead of Rich Dower with the starter Keeson what Weaver has going for him is an added plus he has got as you look at Weaver down in the dugout he's got an added plus because he's got Singleton Murray and Smith that are all switch hitters so all they have to do is turn around. Matlock jumps and gets it. Second one, back to first two. Just a little more bounce. It's in left field. That ball was hit hard, and Matlock did make a good play. He had it right up. You can see a lot of white showing. Now he has to reach in, make sure he gets in. The sensei, he comes in hard, but Garner has just enough time to get the ball out of the way. Rick Dempsey. Catcher, 
had a pretty fair series in the American League playoffs, didn't it? 3 1 pitch. Bat comes apart, bounced out to the second baseman Garner, throws over to first and gets him. And so Dempsey bounces out to end the third inning and play it after three. The Orioles lead the Pirates 5 0. Want to see a bat explode? Watch this. Dempsey's bat just literally comes apart. And he's thrown out at first base. When that lumber, most splinters start flying around, it is a time to be nimble. And when you get the ball out on the end of the bat like that and miss kind of weather where it's down in the 30s you just go back to the dugout and count your fingernails NFL football on ABC that's a big one Sunday night the Rams against the Cowboys the Cowboys now in possession of John Dutton one of the finest defensive linemen in football acquired by way of trade with the Colts of Baltimore then Monday night the Vikes against the Jets in the meantime Tim Foley and this my friend is a contact hitter Keith and it's also the second time around for the batting order for the Pittsburgh Pirates against Mike Flanagan. Parker will follow, and then comes Bill Robinson. Birds are leading five to nothing, and Mike Flanagan's fastball has plenty of pop in it for strike one. When I say contact hitter, Keith, he has struck out only once. That's foul. In his last 238 at bats. Dandy catch by the young lady. <laughs> the ball curled down the lip. Line. And he hasn't struck out at all in his last 138 at bats. So he meets the ball. Looped out into short center field and it drops. See what Base I mean? Yep. Don't get wood on it one way or another. Well, he's up on the bat handle about four inches, and that'll tell you something right there. Listen, you remember a guy, the late Mr. Branch, Ricky, used to say he can't hit, he can't run, he can't field, he can't throw. What he can do is win. He talked to the brat, Eddie Stanky. Well, Timmy Foley may be an uppercase Eddie Stanky. Dave Parker normally uses a piece of wood at the plate, 37 ounces and 37 inches. And the average man needs help to tote it. In the right field, base hit, Parker two for two. Foley turns at second. He's going to third, and he's in there. So you see the southpaw isn't stopping. Those are the Pittsburgh wives. And they've seen their team come from way behind so many times this past season. But Parker two for two against the southpaw. Bill Robinson struck out swinging first time up as Flanning, uh, Flanagan threw him a diving spinning curve that was a beautiful pitch. Now there is a graphic that shows you a significant difference for this year at least against lefties as against righties. Nobody out runners at the corner Foley at third Parker at first Parker has plenty of speed 20 out of 24 in stolen bases and Robinson fouls it off for strike one. Park is amazing. The end of the season, he was going to the opposite field with such great success. He'll go any way on you using that ballpark. He can do so many things. High chopper at third base. Foley holds. DeSensei makes the play. Parker goes to second one out. Now there's a smart play by Tim Foley at third base. He had a notion to try and come, but there's no need to even try. You're down five all. Not the only that, the ball the hit in front of him. Right in front of him. He started to come, and then he kind of kicked himself a little bit, but he made the right play. Here is the big man. Look at that hitting in the National League Championship Series. Tremendous competitor for MVP honors in the league. You can tell how cold it is. The breath pretty steamy. Winds it up, and the pitch is inside. Interesting now as you look at Chuck Tanner because he's got the towel wrapped around his neck because it's chilly as Ethan and all of us have noted. Flanagan has not gone to the chain. That's interesting. And I'm just watching and wondering how long it's going to be before he goes back to that chain. Got Willie on it. Let's see. Fast ball and it's a shot. Second baseman has it. Throw to first base. Run scores. Two out. And finally Pittsburgh gets on the board. Parker going over to third. Foley comes home as Willie Stargell gets an RBI. Two down. Madlock coming to the plate. 
said before of the two ball clubs on the field the Pirates have got to be the one that you would say well they can play catch up with you. They can catch you if you get a big lead. Bill takes it low. There's a change. What a beautiful pitch. One and one to count and here's the pitch. Well he's just got Madlock fooled. That's all there is to that. Bill might have thought it might have been a little low. One one. Madlock takes it. Makes it two and one. Two and two. You could see the finger and then he went inside and that's exactly where Flanagan threw it. He hit that inside corner beautifully. Just outside it's now a full count three balls and two strikes one run is in for Pittsburgh. Dave Parker is over at third. You've got two out. Madlock has got a to me has got just a great swing very very short and very compact. Ball four. Runners at the corner now with two out. That's pretty close pitch. It sure was. Watch it again. He's trying to get the fastball up a little bit. Catcher, save, Just off the inside corner. That's the first walk issued in the ball game by Mike Flanagan. Steve Nicosia is at the plate. We're in the top of the fourth inning, and it's a 5-1 ball game as Flanagan is inside. And the Baltimore bullpen now with Sammy Stewart getting loose just in case. Neither manager on average will waste time. Tanner stayed with Keeson in the first inning. That's hit on the ground to Belanger. The shortstop over the second the short way to get Matlock coming down from first base. And the top of the fourth is over. But Pittsburgh punches through to get one run. And we are at 5-1 in the middle of the fourth. Now to the mat is Jim Rooker. In relief for Bruce Keeson. Bert Blylevin scheduled tomorrow night for Pittsburgh against Jim Palmer for Baltimore. Here's Mike. Who was thrown out by the catcher his first time up. Enrique Romo cranking up in the bullpen for Pittsburgh. Uh, he came over from Seattle and he's performed nobly for them this season. Had Mike leaning on it, took it three and two to count now on the Baltimore pitcher. Well, the reason they have Romo up, the pitcher is the scheduled second hitter. So Chuck Tanner will go to his bench. They're getting along now. Baltimore at bat, bottom of the fourth inning. Flanagan rolls over to the right side, scores <laughs> under Chargers glove, and Flanagan's on. Well, let us see now. Will the pitcher get a hit? Or will the pitcher, uh, first baseman for Pittsburgh, get an error? It looks to me like an error. But we'll see. I got to believe Willie Stardew will like to have those hit to him all day long because I think he'll make the play all day long. But he just didn't get, didn't get the give him an error. They give him an error, and that's a good call. Third error in the ball game for Pittsburgh. Third. And the first one was terribly expensive. Now Bumbry with Mark Belanger to the on deck circle. Bumbry in the ball game, a single score to run. The first run of the game, he's one for two. He finally puts it down. Rooker comes down to get it. Flanagan goes on to second. Garner covers it first. Bumbry speed makes it close. Flanagan running on the bases. And remember, we're not using the designated hitter. In this alternate year of the World Series, playing at the National League way, it is a cold night. The pitcher has been standing out there for quite a while. This is where a lot of people have the pros and cons about that designated hitter. Here's what they like to see in the middle of the summer, where you have the pitcher running the bases like that, and just check the stamina of that pitcher and see if he can go nine innings and run the bases a few times. Mark Belanger, the batter, with one out. You don't like the DH, do you? Well, not especially. Belanger swings and misses. You see Madlock the third baseman of course Belanger can handle that bat so well and Madlock knows that through their scouting reports he's even with a bag and just off the edge of the grass he is not going to give Belanger the bunt he will bunt on you. There's a little looper 
and it'll carry to center field, and Moreno makes the catch. Two down. Ball had more spin on it. As he went underneath it, and it just lifted right on out to center. Now here's the guy he's got to get by. Singleton. After Singleton Murray, they're a tremendous one-two punch. Here's a case that really puts a lot of burden on the outfield. Now, we've talked about the bad weather. We've talked about the outfield being in really tough condition. Well, a good outfielder is going to know. I've got a pitcher at second base, two outs. i got to know that there's a guy at the plate that can hit the ball to me hard for a base hit. I've got to charge it hard because I know I've got to play at the plate, but now I've also got that bad turf. High to right center. Moreno and Parker, and it's Parker on the call and the catch. And the inning is over. So Flanagan stops at second base. And after four, Baltimore five, and Pittsburgh one. Game number two tomorrow night, 8 o'clock Eastern time here on ABC. Game number three goes over to Pittsburgh on Friday at 8 Eastern time. We're concerned right now with the opening game of this 76th World Series. And the Buccaneers with a big crowd having traveled over to Baltimore. They gobbled up every ticket available to them. And they're enjoying a 5-1 to one lead right now as we go to the top of the fifth inning. And we will go with Don Drysdale to call the play for you. And Don, this is the third largest crowd for a World Series game here in the stadium's history, 53,735. And you've got to give them all credit, Keith, because they are here under adverse conditions because it is chilly, and they had a big crowd here last night that stayed through the rain until they finally called it. But they've, right now, they've got their Orioles on top 5-1, to one, as it'll be Garner and then a pinch hitter. And we'll go to the top of the order in Omar Moreno. This is the young man who wants to make up, and you see how well he hit in the championship series. He wants to make up for his critical error in the first inning. Now Garner caught looking his first time at bat at 293 on the regular season. Matty Sanguian has come out to the on deck circle as a pinch hitter. Now Chuck Tanner going to the old pro Manny Sanguian. Manny's another veteran of that 71 series. When the Bucks play the birds it's like a city series. Good change and Flanagan out in front on two. It's that kind of rivalry. The cities are not that far apart. That's Mrs. Phil Garner. It hard and hooking away from Lowenstein. It'll go to the wall. Garner on his way for two as Lowenstein will hit the cutoff man Belanger and Garner leads it off in the Pittsburgh fifth with a double. So as they started the lineup the second time around last inning, they began to get to Flanagan and scored a run. Look at that. Look where that pitch was done. Got the breaking pitch up over the plate. Now look at that ball hooking away from Lowenstein. He had no chance whatsoever. Then skipping through the mud and off the wall. The biggest thing you could do then was run it down. So Garner's at second base, and here's Manny Sanguian. And we told you about the Bucks' ability to play catch-up baseball. They did it all year long. In the late innings, they can terrify it. There's not a weak spot in their lineup. That is to Belanger on a couple of hops as he will throw Sanguian out. Now Garner has to remain at second base, and we go to the top of the order on Omar Moreno. He is 0 for 2 tonight. He's bounced to second, and he's lined to center. And there is Mrs. Moreno. Trying to get something started with the whistle. <laughs> Come on, sweetie, you can do it. <laughs> she knows the folks here. To... <laughs> well, he's done it all year. He's had a fine year. 282, eight home runs, 69 RBIs, 77 stolen bases. And as we've said, he can make this club go. That's that pitch. Good off-speed breaking pitch. Beautiful. 0-2 to Moreno. Good curveball. The fourth strikeout for Flanagan tonight. And as you look at it again, it came at a big time. He pitched Moreno beautifully. First the changeup, got him on a swinging strike, and then the curveball. And here is the little contact hitter, Timmy Foley. 
Well, you see, Foley one for two. He's fly to left, single and scored. The only pirate run of the night. That was in the fourth inning. There you see a Foley up on that bat handle. He's up about four inches. Big hop to the sensei. Gets the handle and throws him out. Now the Pirates are gone in the fifth inning. And after four and a half, it remains Baltimore five and Pittsburgh one. Now well, we're back in Baltimore with the Orioles on top five to one. Just about everybody getting into the act. There's the Oriole here in Baltimore. And we have the third Pittsburgh pitcher of the evening. It'll be Enrique Romo coming on. Romo just prior to going to the mound he made sure that he walked into home plate umpire Jerry Newdecker and Newdecker was telling him he said now no you can't go with your fingers to your mouth Romo then gestured can I blow on my hand he said yes but don't put your fingers in your mouth it'll be Murray Lowenstein and the sensei as you look at Enrique Romo make Romo a record of 10 and 5 on the year he made 84 appearances. That's one thing about Chuck Tanner. He used that bullpen. You had Romo with 84. You had Tacovi with 94. And Grant Jackson with 72. Romo, he was acquired from the Seattle Mariners with Rick Jones. They sent a fine young shortstop over there, Mario Mendoza. Also Odell Jones, a pitcher, Rafael Vasquez, that was in December of 78. And now you see what Weaver has. He gets to have Murray come up, and he'll turn around and hit the other way. And he won for one tonight. He walked and scored and sinked. Well, what you have to look for with Romo is that remarkable screwball that Harvey Haddix loves to talk about. He said, I've never seen one like it anywhere. I tell you, it goes straight down. Well, yeah. <laughs> He'll throw you everything but the kitchen sink every now and then. Now Murray stands in as we get ready to go to the Baltimore fifth, five to one Baltimore. Because it goes straight down is another reason New Deck had told him to keep his fingers <laughs> out of his mouth. Drysdale, an expert on the subject. <laughs> I've stayed breaking fits. <laughs> There's a Baltimore fan. And you know that they're happy. Romo moving him back with that breaking pitch, and that's been their slogan there. The bird will fly. This is maybe one of the few fastballs that you'll see Romo throw. Yeah, but he threw that almost out of the ballpark, too. <laughs> They're going to let Murray get a hold of it. He misses, and Murray walks. Tried to bring that breaking pitch from the outside in. Mike Marshall didn't have a bad one either, Howard. And still there. Now Johnny Lowenstein comes on. He was on on the big air by Garner in the first inning. That accounted for a couple of runs. He later came on to score and he struck out, so he's 0 for 2. Fly ball center field, Moreno. That is out number one. Now with one out and Murray at first base that'll bring on Doug DeSensei who homered his first time at bat and he walked in the third so he's one for one and has a couple of RBI's. Remember what we said early in the telecast about the unexpected ones so often being World Series heroes. Of course we're only in game one and it's very early but this is the kind of guy who doesn't have the big stats going into the series who can kill you. And in this first game, he is thus far, apart from possibly Mike Flanagan, the outstanding player with his two-run home run. Little looper, and it could be trouble. Parker will be there. And he just about slipped as he made the catch. Now Murray at first base, two outs, and the second baseman, Billy Smith, comes on. I'd love to have a sound mic on Parker's shoes out there in right field. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's a warmer night, the frogs would be croaking. You know that he's got to be sloshing around. 
Yeah, but I tell you, the beating this thing has taken. They've had five football games here. The weather just hammered Three of them in the rain, Keith. And it's uh, it's incredible they could even get it in this good of shape. They really have worked their tail off. That is how the birds picked up a big five in the first inning. There goes Murray. There's the strike, and forget about it. Nikoja could not find the handle, and Murray has a stolen base standing up. Billy Smith, he is just tickled to death to be in this series. He said, you know, he said, it's like a kid in Wonderland. I guess that could be true, I guess, for everybody that's been in a World Series a time or two, or even the first time, especially the first time. And especially a young man who really isn't going to be a regular for somebody, but, you know, if fortune has it, now they're going to put him on. So he can, one of these days, tell his grandchildren they walk me intentionally. And of course the reasoning behind that you've got the right hand hitter Rick Dempsey standing right behind him. Yeah but Rick is a dangerous hitter despite his low batting stance. This Baltimore team lulls you. There's a guy here that you don't pay attention to him and he's going to hurt you with him. Had a big key double here in the very first game against the Angels in the playoff series. Ryan looks to the runner, the 2-2 delivery. High fly ball out to left field. That one might be out of here, and it's off the wall. Dempsey is headed to second to Sensei, will score easily, and it's a 2-1 game. Full count, now three and two, and with two outs, the runners will be going. Murray from second base and Billy Smith from first. It's 5-1 Baltimore. We're in the bottom of the fifth. You see Billy Smith talking with his first base coach, Jimmy Fry. How about Jimmy Fry? One of the rumors, and good Lord, uh, with all the gathering of baseball people this time of the year, there are a million rumors. I don't know if there's any substance to it at all, but a lot of talk that Jim Fry might get the call to go to Kansas City as manager. It's a pretty good ball club to inherit. <laughs> Runners go. That's loop foul. Well, the count remains full. Three balls, two strikes, two outs, two on. Beginning with George Brett. Yeah, how'd you like to inherit George Brett? <laughs> Excuse me, I did, <clears throat> did a show with him over the weekend at Pepperdine University. He had been out hunting with Whitey Herzog, the deposed manager. He's in great shape, by the way. He said, I came too late, hit 329. He said, I should have hit 350 this year. Runners go again. And he pops him up in shallow left field. There is Robinson, and that is out number three. Well, Baltimore is gone. They lead it five to one through five, and we'll be back with more baseball after this word from our local stations. Now Mike Flanagan starting inning number six. And had a chance to talk with Mike a little bit. There's his record. About the hitters that really concerned him on the Pittsburgh Pirate Club, and this is what he had to say. Now you've studied the scouting reports on the Pittsburgh lineup. Do you find yourself thinking mainly about Parker and Stargell, or do you feel you have a big edge against them because you're a southpaw and you're more concerned about Matlock? Actually, I am more concerned about the right-handed hitters. Uh, uh, left handers I usually pitch more or less the same way but the right handers uh, Madlock and uh, Bill Robinson especially gave me some trouble this spring so I'm, I'm more concerned about the right hand hitters and I'll try to pitch my same same game against the lefties. Well so far he's allowed the Pirates to run on four hits and here in the sixth inning and so far this man is two for right two that's, the lefty. Right. that's right it'll be Parker Robinson and Stargell. Parker, he doubled his first time at bat and singled his second time at bat. First time, it's interesting. There you see Steve Stone. He had a fine year. Well, we saw him pitch a dandy in Milwaukee. Yes, sir. We really did. One of the biggest games of the year. It's One the game hitter. that put Milwaukee out of things. There's three for three for Parker. <laughs> as Bumbry will play it on a hopper. Boy, you want a ball player this guy is. He is just great. Let's watch his swing. 
He got so hot at the end of the year, he had a five-hit game in the final series, as you saw that. Describe that swing. Now, to me, it's, it's really kind of a picture swing. He didn't have a big stride, very short and quick, and then boom, his hands took over. He's got to be strong, as we mentioned before, swinging at 37, 37 bat. It's 37 inches, 37 ounces. Here's Robinson. One ball, no strikes. Robinson 0 for 2 has struck out and bounced to third. Here's another guy that can hurt you with just one swing of the bat. 24 home runs on the year and 75 RBIs. Good change. <laughs> That's the pitch we told you about at the start of the game. You heard Mike Flanagan himself describe it. It's the pitch that made him, as he said it, a four-pitch pitcher instead of a two-pitch pitcher. It's the pitch that made him a complete pitcher. Loop to right, and that's going to be a base hit. As Singleton gets on it in a hurry, and Parker has to stop at second base, so all of a sudden the Bucks have got something going here in the sixth inning. The one thing about a scout report for a pitcher is you can't put circumstances on a piece of paper. That's the problem. Now the Bucks on top of the Baltimore Orioles in the hit department 6-5, but with three errors for Pittsburgh, Baltimore on top in the run department 5-1 as Willie Stargell comes on. And here they are chopping back. Well, they're just one big swing of the bat in this guy from being right back in it. Stoddard's also working in the bullpen for the birds. Good off-speed curveball. There started the big guy on the left side and left-hander Tippy Martinez on the right side of your screen. Stoddard is huge. He's the rat ads type. <laughs> He's a power forward in the basketball. That's group. right. Stargell over two tonight is struck out and bounced a second. Drop from the side. Owen to the count. Notice no batting gloves to start. With. That is a rarity today. But there's Chuck Tanner. Good oh. speed curveball. He has really pitched Willie beautifully. Strikeout number five, and the second time he's gotten Willie. Look at it again. By way of first base, he's taken just enough off of it, and Stargell has already committed himself. Here's Madlock. Bounce the third and walk. Loop to right center, but Singleton coming on in a hurry and makes the kick. Now Parker has to stay at second base, and Robinson at first base. On that turf, that was not an easy play. No, it wasn't. I'll guarantee you Earl Weaver took a deep gulp down in that dugout. Kenny had to go all out and risk that a Spikes would hold. The chief groundskeeper told us the Spikes would hold. Dave Parker has had trouble in that area tonight with the Spikes. But for Kenny and Frank Robinson right there, motioning to his outfielders where to play. Made a pretty good pitch on Mal. He got that pitch in on him. He had to kind of inside out that ball a little bit. Don Robinson throwing in the bullpen for Pittsburgh. That's a fireball. It throws bullets. Robinson's one of those guys. He's got to use his strengths. He's got to pitch his game as you look at it. Same thing as I was saying with Tacoby. The whip like arm, the buggy whip arm, everything low. He's got good stuff. If he's healthy, that's the key to Robinson this year. Nikoji over two tonight. Hit hard and look out foul. Hit to the hole. This Sensei boots the ball, picks it up, and can't make a play. Parker goes to third. His second base is Robinson, and the Pirates have the bases loaded. Now we'll see how they score that as you take another peek at it. Tough play. The ball really didn't. It hung up in the air for a long time and forced Doug into the position of having to short hop it. But they're going to give him an error. He deserved it. Well, that's what you get after they watch you make great plays all the time. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Now's the chance for Garner to really atone. 
for that first inning era that opened the door to DeSensei's do run home. This is the first Baltimore fielding mistake, the one you just saw. And let's see if the Pirates can capitalize. Good fastball for a strike. 89 miles an hour, they clock it. Lee Lacey down in the on-deck circle. And that is a good pinch hitter, the former Dodger. Good off-speed curveball. There's Mrs. Garner. What do you think she is in pulling? What a beautiful change of speed pitch. Garner closed the regular season with a 14-game hitting streak, and now the fans come alive here in Baltimore. The two strikes. They look for the strikeout. Look out, and a great save by Dempsey. How about that? That had uh, backstop all over it, didn't it? Oh, this was a look at it again. This is a truly exceptional play. Tried to take a little bit off of that breaking pitch inside and bounce it down at the feet, and that is a tough play for a catcher, but look the way Dempsey plays. Wild pitch written all over. A ball, two strike. How do you like that figure? That's the one we mentioned earlier. Hit hard, base hit left field. Here comes Parker. Here comes Robinson. Lowenstein will bring it back to third base, and all of a sudden it is five to three, Baltimore, with the tying runs aboard. They keep coming back. And certainly Ghana has a tone. I'll tell you, he just fights that slider off of him and hits it to the hole. And now that will bring out Earl Weaver. Lowenstein has no play. Johnny just makes a good play to get in front of the ball and get it back in. So Weaver will talk to Flanagan and Dempsey. In the sixth. Phil Garner's up with the bases loaded and the Pirates trailing five to one. Two run score as the Bucks play what will be the theme of this series, comeback. There's That's the kid, Phil Garner, right there. He likens this Pirates team or clubhouse to the way it used to be in Oakland. 0-1 to Lacey, who hit 247 on the year with five home runs and 15 RBIs. Now the Pirates trying to fight back. The tying runs aboard. Lacey's grown accustomed to this pace. He's the only man in baseball who's played in the last three World Series. That's right. With the Dodgers for the last two years, and now this year with the Bucks. Paycheck's getting to be a habit. <laughs> <laughs> he kind of likes it. It's like Bob Fleming used to be in the Super Bowls. <laughs> <laughs> That's bounce foul. Joe Lynette will make the play. Lacey coming to the Pirates in the reentry free agent draft this year. Desense bobbles the ball. Does he make the play? No! And he can't make the tag. So two airs by Doug DeSense here in the sixth inning has given the Pirates the light. And how quickly the shifting tides of fortune can change. There you look at it again and the ball actually the ball Doug let the ball play him. The ball came up on him and then he misses the tag. And then the Koja just about slides by the bag and he almost gets him coming back as you take another peek at it. Talk about the brilliance of his defensive play. You give him the edge over Matt Locke in fielding for that brilliance. You talk with him about his great play to save the series against the Angels. And just then, he comes up with two errors that have led to the Bucks' two runs thus far in this inning. Pops him up. Bumbry right there. And that is out number three. So the Bucks are gone, but they pick up a couple of runs. And after five and a half, it is five to three, Baltimore. That's Phil Garner. I talked about the Oakland clubhouse, the Pittsburgh clubhouse. He's been in both. I talked with him about that. Would you contrast for me? The atmosphere in the Oakland clubhouse when they were in their heyday with the atmosphere in this current Bucks clubhouse. 
a lot of similarities. Of course, there is the same free-spirited uh, atmosphere. There's a lot of jovial kidding, a lot of jiving back and forth, a lot of games being played against ball players. I think there's a certain amount of camaraderie that we have uh, among our teammates here that we certainly had in Oakland. But I think the big thing, uh, the two big things are, we had a great leader in Oakland in Sal Bando. We have a great leader in this clubhouse in the Will Stargell. But uh, another great uh, similarity between the two clubs is that although we kid around in the clubhouse a lot and sometimes uh, we get angry at each other, but once we put that uniform on, we're, we're strictly professional. We have one thing in mind, that's to go out and win a ball game. Now the words of Phil Garner. He drove in a couple in the sixth inning for Pittsburgh to make it five to three Baltimore and you're looking at Don Robinson. He is the fourth Pirate pitcher. We said before Chuck Tanner will go through that staff if he has to. He'll try and hold you wherever he can. Robinson on the year he only relieved four times. He started 25 times a record of eight and eight and a three eight six ERA as he will face Flanagan the bottom of the order and then we'll go to the top of the order in Bunbury and Belanger. I'll say one thing about Flanagan. He's got he a swing. Get yeah. cheated. <laughs> For a guy who hasn't hit in how many years? Oh, I don't know. But you know, that was one of the things they talked about. Uh, Mike Flanagan, you, you two guys brought it up a little bit earlier. That he can swing the bat a little bit. He yeah. hasn't actually hit for himself since 1975. And I guess that was down at Rochester. <laughs> They were laughing here and had stories in the paper about the pitchers, the Baltimore pitchers getting the ready to hit. Somebody, I think, made the right statement when they said, you know, it's kind of like riding a bicycle once you learn how. And if you can do it all right, well, you really never forget. Good swing, but he strikes out. You know, you look at this ball game in perspective. You can see how quickly the ebb and flow can change. In the first inning, DeSensei with the two-run home run, the hero. Then DeSensei with the two errors, the goat. In the first inning, Ghana with the big error, the goat. But now Ghana with those two runs driven in and two hits in his last two at-bats coming on, making up for the mistake of the first inning. Now that will bring on Bumbry. To Foley, he's got to go, and they get him. Two gone. Well, this telecast is presented by authority of Major League Baseball and is intended solely for the private, non-commercial use of our audience. Any publication, reproduction, retransmission, or the use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this game without the express written consent of Major League Baseball is prohibited. I'm glad you finally got to read that. <laughs> He's been waiting all season. <laughs> the big thrill. There's two gone, and here's Mark Belanger. Meanwhile, Look out. as usual, the Twin D got us some runs. Yep. We've got a tough, tight ball game now, and a typical Pittsburgh ball game. Coming back, coming back, and the relief is holding on. A ball and a strike to Belanger. He's 0 for 2, but he walked in the first and scored a run. That was an unearned run. The uh, Birds have not had a hit for three and two thirds innings. Two hops to Foley. Low and Stargell a good play to dig it out. And Baltimore gone one, two, three here in the sixth inning. Three up, three down. There you look at it one more time. Foley stayed back now. He sees the big hop. And now in the dirt to Stargell. And the big guy stays right with it, makes a good play. So after six, five, three, ball the more. That's the story from Memorial Stadium in Baltimore. Game one of the 1979 World Series. I'm Don Drysdale, Keith Jackson, Howard Cosell. As we go to the seventh, and once again, here's Keith. And we look to Tim Foley, the Pirate shortstop to lead it off. Parker's on deck. Robinson will follow. 5 3 ball game as Flanagan pitches, and it's rolled to Belanger. And that thing is a little bit like a hot potato, isn't it? But that's exactly why Earl Weaver is playing Mark Belanger in this, the first game of the 79 World Series. Look at the antelope. That is not an easy play for Belanger. That ball's hit pretty good, but well, I don't know how many Golden Gloves he's had, but I'll tell you one thing, that's exactly why he makes it. Look, 
a little bit like Mr. Marty Marion. A little bit. Dave yes, Parker, three for three. Double, single, single, score to run. Tap toward the sensei. Doug comes and throws and gets him. Two down. Well, there's the first time that Flanagan tonight has gone to the off-speed pitches yep. to Parker. Right. The other three times he went to the hard stuff and he said, well, Mr. Dave, you made a believer out of me. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget, on Saturday at 3.30 Eastern, Oklahoma and Texas out of the Cotton Bowl in Dallas. Freddie Akers, Horns undefeated. Barry Switzer, Sooners undefeated. Featuring the Heisman Trophy winner, Billy Sims. And Bill Robinson hits it high in the air to right field. Where Ken Singleton waits. Calls off Al Bundy and makes the catch. And so very quickly, Flanagan retires the Pirates at the top of the seventh. And the score remains 5-3 Baltimore. We'll go to the bottom of the seventh inning now. John Denver's uh, country boy music in the background of the crowd standing and taking their seventh inning stretch, Don Robinson. He's out on the mound for Pittsburgh. He'll be working to Ken Singleton, Eddie Murray, and John Lowenstein. He's got a flamethrower on the mound, and you've got big guys coming to the plate who love to jump on the hard stuff. Robinson pitched two innings of the National League Championship Series. He's got a save and a victory, but he still has a bit of a problem with a sore right shoulder. Doesn't bother him going an inning or two, but get beyond that sometimes, and it grabs him. And he's had a whole bunch of x-rays already on that shoulder, trying to figure out exactly what... More than 30. Mm. More than 30. If he's going to have trouble, it would seem to be against Singleton and Murray and Lowenstein. Singleton goes back over to the other side of the plate, being a switch hitter, and he takes strike one, and Robinson certainly not backing down. He came right at him with a bullet. Pulls a string on one and misses, and it's one and one. For those of you who have joined us a little late, we'll tell you in just a moment as the pitch is inside the single and just how it all happened. Pittsburgh jumped out in front by a score of five nothing getting five runs and there were errors of commission as well as omission in that first inning by Pittsburgh enabling Baltimore to get the big five but the Pirates came back with one in the fourth and two more in the sixth and that's where we are at five three. Don Robinson is the fourth pitcher for Pittsburgh. Keeson started did not get out of the first inning. Rooker followed pitched well then Romo for an inning and now Robinson. And the count is three and one to Ken Singleton. And it's fouled away. Of course, the weather is one of uh, five or six things that mankind can't do much about. Welcome to the Winter Olympics. <laughs> three two pitch. Ball four. Now the bird fans come alive. They know there's a flamethrower out there. They know Murray's a fastball hitter. Remember, he's had 25 home runs, 99 runs batted in. Tonight, he's one for one, the single game when he was batting right-handed. Yeah, sign, mood of the fans, all speaking for themselves. Again, for those of you who might have joined us late, we Kuhn decided at 524 after traversing the field with the head groundskeeper that this game could be played. Fly ball to center field. Marino loops around and settles, makes the catch. One out, singled, and goes back to first base. He changed up on that. That was not the fireball. It's a good pitch. Darn good pitch. Here comes Big John Lowenstein. We have 254 on the year. There are the numbers tonight. He's done a little bit of everything for Earl Weaver's ball club this year. He's a pinch hitter, pinch runner, played all three outfield positions, filled in a couple of times at first and third. And one time he played all three outfield positions in the same game this past season. There goes Singleton. The pitch is hit high in the air to the left side. And Bill Robinson, the left fielder, makes the catch. You've got two out. Third base, third down. Just watching Sensei now. Watching Lowenstein run off the field. He's limping a little bit, Keith. I just yeah, wonder yes. whether he might have pulled something out there in that outfield line. He might not go out for the next inning with now that he's flied out. He, they might send Renicky out there. Here's the Sensei. He hits the ball hard to right center field. Parker with his 
Dashing speed oh. on his long arms, runs it down on one of the best plays of the night. And so, great catch by Parker. The Orioles are turned away. And we have played seven innings of baseball with Baltimore leading by a score of five to three. And as we watch Parker run it down, he just literally outran the baseball. You see him splashing see that through splash? that puddle? That's it. So there we are, and back with more baseball after this word from our local stations. John Lowenstein is in the dugout now. He's out of the ball game, showing some signs of a sore left leg, replacing him in left field, Gary Renicky, who is a fine defensive ball player. And speaking of defense, that play, that inning ending play by Parker, was exactly why we had to give him the edge over Singleton. He saved a run with the play. He has marvelous foot speed, especially for so big a man. As we said, he can do so many things. A superb athlete. Willie Stargell leads off, and Willie Stargell has had his troubles with the lefty Mike Flanagan of the ball game. Struck him out in the second inning, got him on a roller to second base. So Willie did deliver a run batted in on that roller. He struck him out again, swinging in the sixth inning. He's been showing him that changeup, and Willie has not handled it. He comes back with a breaking thing that just drops out of sight, and now he's out in front, two strikes. Well, he came into this game troubled. He sent word up to me after I'd gotten to the booth that his room was burglarized last night. So he was robbed of $2,000 and a lot of stereo equipment. And you hate to see that happen to anybody, let alone a man so fine as this. Why a service story just confirmed the information that Willie had sent up to me early. Joe Safety came up earlier and confirmed it as well. Don Stanhouse now cranking up in the bullpen for <laughs> Baltimore. He's going to be a free agent, I guess. He's also sure. a free spirit. <laughs> he is. He, uh, over in the Pittsburgh bullpen now, you have the left-hander Grant Jackson. Jackson, incidentally, was a pitcher for Baltimore back in the 1971 World Series. Hit high, hard, and Good deep, bye. and so long. It's a 5-4 ball game. You can get Starjo for a while, but sooner or later. Right now, this game is clearly in the pattern of the Pittsburgh team during the whole second half of the season. Tanner using relief pitcher on relief pitcher. The relief pitchers holding tight. They've gone five and a third innings now. As you look at this again, without allowing a hit to the birds and then pecking away pecking away getting the key hits given the opportunity gone is two run blow and now Stargell so we've got a one run ball game in the eighth Willie Stargell rocks one high and deep over the right field fence and the screws tighten on Flanagan it's something Mr. Stargell has done many times this season the gap is narrowed to 5-4. There's Stargell down in the Pittsburgh dugout. 5-4 now. Buccaneers have eight hits in the ball game. Baltimore has been nailed down by this succession of relief pitchers for Pittsburgh, and Bill Metlock stands at the plate and takes strike one. Bill didn't like the call, as you can see. Now, out of the Parker Stargell duo against the Southpaw, the winningest pitcher in the big leagues. Four hits, three for Dave Parker, and the big home run just now by Willie Stargell. Well, you can see that Madlock's a little hot, and he's talking with a man that will give it right back to him. I'll guarantee you that. Jerry Newdecker. He will not take too much. The ball is hit to center field for Bumbry. One out. Now the pirate catcher in the coach comes up. He's been on base twice with a double and a single. And was caught looking by Flanagan back in the third. Excuse me, I'm looking at the wrong man. It's Nicosia. I was looking at Garner's stats. He's over three. That ball is fouled off on the right side and drops into the crowd. Oh, he really had Nicosia fishing. So Steve strikes out, 
on a bad pitch. And you've got two down. Well, he gets the change up. He doesn't get it to the height that I don't think he wants it, but he has enough off of it outside. And the coach, he just can't lay off. And here's the little Peppa Pot with the two runs batted in in the sixth inning in the clutch after the sensei had opened the door with a big error and then the sensei made a subsequent error that did not cost at six strikeouts now for Mike Flanagan and he's low to Garner it'll be Burt by 11 for Pittsburgh tomorrow against Jim Palmer not the usual season for Palmer One ball and one strike now. Lowenstein's problem, sore ankle. Banged it up back on August 9. And he hobbled a bit with it and it took him out of the ball game. Garner swings and misses. Oh, another excellent change. And I would guess that sore ankle by Low. I would just think that wet turf might, might have yes, just it aggravated. Must have aggravated. That's all, that's all it was. I'd like this brings up and makes those little eggs big eggs sometimes too. The sensei at third lost it in the lights. You could see that. Some yeah. trying to shield his eyes. Trying to fight it all the way. That'll be a base hit. Now he's trying to side saddle it. It gets up and all of a sudden he's his whoop it's in the lights. Tries to shade, tries to side saddle, get it out of the light. And he just can't. He cannot do it. It won't come out. Rene Stennett comes out as Chuck Tanner continues to use the bench. There's another look at it, and that's tough. That ball gets in the lights and it won't come out. You try and move to this side. You might you have time, move to the other side. And at times when it just doesn't come out, Can't that's exactly play. what happens. Doogie feels a little bit snake bit with what's happened to him in the later innings. A 5-4 ball game here in the top of the eighth inning and Stennett punches it down into the right field side. It's going to drop in there for a base hit. It drops softly, enabling Garner to make the turn and go to third. And with two outs, you have runners at the corner. Now you wonder how long Earl Weaver is going to go with this. A one-run ball game and the Pirates insistently chopping away at that once big lead. Well, he kind of inside out the ball that? just a Beautiful. little bit. And he just drops it down in the corner. And, of course, Garner with two outs. He's going to be going all the way. He makes it to third easily. They know the arm of Singleton, who got on the ball fairly quickly. And Stennett was not going to be the third out going to second base. And the reason that they will stay with Flanagan right here. Is because he's left it. Now, number one, he's won 23 ball games. He's the winningest pitcher in the major leagues. And you've got the left hand hitting Moreno standing at the plate. But he has given up 10 hits. And he's given four of those hits to the left handed hitters. Three to Parker, as we said. And a big home run to Willie Stodgell in this very inning. Moreno 0 for 4 in the ball game. So if you're a Buccaneer fan, you believe in the law of averages. You probably are taking a little hope here. That's fouled away. But that pitch up. Punch foul back in the crowd. That's 125 pitches now for Mike Flanagan. Fouled him out on a curve. So Keith, Earl Weaver stuck with his ace. That's a close pitch. Boy, you think this is a nasty pitch. Besides being close, and it is right there. So Flanagan hangs in and gets his man. And we've got a 5-4 ball game in the middle of the eighth inning. Speaking of baseball fever, here's a sample of what it's like in Baltimore in 1979 with Wild Bill Higgy leading the crowd. <laughs> He's a cab driver. Yes, he here is. In Baltimore. And he's got all 53,000 plus people right with him. Brant Jackson comes on now. He is the fifth Pittsburgh pitcher in this ball game. Jackson with a record of eight and five. He was in 72 ball games this past season. He'll be pitching to Billy Smith, Rick Dempsey, and Mike Flanagan, unless Earl Weaver has something going and decides to hit the Flanagan. 
5-4 ball game. Baltimore has not done anything with the stick since the second inning. Here is Dower hitting for Smith. Rich Dower comes up to hit for Billy Smith. Five four. Baltimore at bat in the bottom of the eighth inning. And it's shut up the middle by Dower. Base hit. He is becoming a very tough out. You're right. He is a typical Baltimore ball player. The kind of guy gets no ink. Look for this pitch here. Yep, reached for it. Shot it into center. But he's gotten a lot of big hits this year. And he's solid in the field. He's matured into a ball player. And just one more of the students and pupils out of USC and Rod Dato's crew. That's right. Kent to Colby. The whip. Look at that delivery. I'm telling you, if you've met him on the street or in the store, you'd never in the world think he was a professional baseball player. Nope, you'd figure he was teaching philosophy at Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> Jackson now will pitch to Rick Dempsey. Dempsey hitless. Fouls it back. Normally in a situation like this where you'd have a designated hitter, well, you'd probably see Dempsey bunting because the pitcher would not be hitting that. It's true. Excellent point. Pops him up. Moreno, with his great speed, comes gliding in to make the catch. One out. But that's the way it is this year with no DH in effect in this series. Next year, they go back to the DH in effect. Alternating years. That's exact. The odd years, right now, they have no DH. The even years, they go to the designated hitter. Look at Flanagan. He gets a standing ovation. Crowd of more than 53,000. Up. You might see Flanagan, but... Right. This year, in a ballpark estimate, the winning team will probably get about $30,000 per person. The losing team, probably about $25,000 per person. Madlock certainly thinks he's going to bunt. He's going to shake hands with him. Look out. And that one got a piece, bit Steve Nikosia. Hit him hard. You know, I was wondering about this field, guys. I just, you know, we're not going to get any any uh, any help because it's going to freeze tonight or whatever so this field is not going to dry out overnight not much just have to hope for some sunshine tomorrow we may get them on soon <laughs> there's a strike what was it Edward Bennett Williams said last night I asked him how he felt about the postponement and Ed said Bowie Kuhn is a man of courage a man of steel who would call off a game in the face of a monsoon. <laughs> <laughs> One two pitch to Flanagan. He's gone. Strikes out. Big out. That is a big out. So Bumber will come now with two down and Dower at first base. Now here's where you go to your scouting book. Here's where you think about the move of Grant Jackson at first base. Even though you've got Bumbry at the plate, you know that Bumbry's going to have to hit one over somebody's head or up the alley somewhere. And Pittsburgh has got speed all over that outfield to try and score Dower from first base. Hits it to the shortstop Foley. He goes to the second baseman Garner to get the force on the runner coming down. And after eight innings of play, the score. Baltimore five and Pittsburgh four and here's the play that completed eight as Foley played it well looked it all the way into his glove waited for Garner and got the third out final chance for the Pirates coming up Rich Dower stays to play second base for Baltimore in the top of the ninth inning he had 17 errors at second base during the course of the season there's your line score in the ball game for Pittsburgh Tim Foley Dave Parker Bill Robinson and Mike Flanagan on 126 pitches trying to go the distance Pittsburgh this year 
if you like to play the numbers game. One, 25 ball games in the ninth inning. Well, you couldn't ask to have the cards stacked any better than what you have it right now. Here you've got the pesky little guy fully trying to lead it off and get on base if he can. With Parker with three hits coming right. next. And Robinson, who by Flanagan's own admission in the interview that we did with him that you heard, saying that Robinson troubles him and always has. Now here is Foley. And Flanagan has a strike. On the ground of the shortstop, Belanger. High throw, but Murray flags it down for out number one. Looked like that ball was going to sail for a second. Dead at the start. This turned out to be a tight, tough ball game where it started out with the appearance of a route. Excuse me, because of the five Baltimore runs in the first inning. Here's a man who can tie it up with one swing. And that's Mrs. Parker. Tie it up. Tie it up. Well, she's not the only Pirate fan open for that. And he's capable of tying it up, I'll guarantee you that. One swing could do it. Ball is hit on the ground up the middle. Base hit for Dave Parker. It didn't take him long. So it's four hits for Dave Parker. And a brilliant play in right center field on DeSensei to save a run. Look at this swing again. That just that short stride. Just pop and glide, and that's it. Well, he's got to put that on the first tee. Oh, man. <laughs> I don't think this man can hit it out. 24 home runs on the season. Stanhouse and Martinez. Martinez, the left-hander. Stanhouse, a right-hander. Oh, oh, they've oh, got oh. Parker picked off. He's safe. Parker goes barreling into second base, and he clobbers Belanger, and the ball is apparently loose, and Belanger is down. I tell you, he went in hard, and he just actually forced that air. He went in, he talked about an 89-foot slide, and that's exactly what happened. They have him dead to rights right here. Yes, now Murray did. can't get it out of the that's glove, That's the problem. That's what I wanted to call attention to. You're seeing Parker go down, and he was almost down there by the time the ball passed him, and that was the problem. Had Murray made the throw promptly, it would have been no contest. Here's Murray. Now they got him. Now he double clutches a little bit. Notice. He reaches in. And look how long it takes for that ball to get there. But look at this slide by Parker. And he is right on Belanger's glove. And he just kicks it out. And who does that remind you? Look at it pop in the air. Good camera that work. Remind, what does that remind you of? Yes, Stanky sir. and Rizzuto. That's right. Back in 1951, when Eddie Stanky kicked it out of the Scooter's glove. There it is. Yeah, but he's out. That's a good angle. He was Belanger out. Can hang on. The play became needlessly close, as Don pointed out, because of the lateness of the Murray throw. And well, Andrew stays. He's all right. You give credit to the second base umpire. That is Russ Getz. He was right on top of that play. Charge Belanger with an error. Each team now with three errors in the ball game. The tying run at second base. One out. Robinson, your batter. That was a great move by Flanagan. He had him dead to rights. And you know, he really hadn't gone over there all night long with any serious move at all. Well, he got eight this year. He's really worked on that. Now the pitch to Robinson. And Bill, got to be, oh, the adrenaline is just the thumpity thump. Earl Weaver, a manager who's not afraid of the second guess, staying still with his ace. Willie Stargell is on deck. Pitch blocked. It's in the dirt. Dempsey comes up with it. Well, the thing right here, Weaver is not sitting in the good position. If he goes out to make the move to bring the right-hander in, he knows That's one right. thing. Tanner's sitting over there with John Miller on the bench, too. Or Mike Easler. Eddie Ott, he's got a bunch of left-handers over there just waiting in the wings. Good pitch. Flanagan now 131 pitches. That's a long night's work. I tell you, this little guy here, he's showing you some 
a little fortitude out there tonight. Well, especially when he had Robinson uh, Parker picked off and he thought that would be it. Up, cued to the second baseman, Dower. Two down. Parker at third. So it comes down to this. The big man who homered in his last time at bat to open the eighth inning to make it a one-run ball game. A man who many think will be the MVP in the National League. Fans on their feet waiting for out number three. They'll watch it standing up. Willie Stargell on playing in the series says, quote, getting into the World Series is like savoring a fine meal. It's something you take slowly and enjoy every minute. It's the best of seven feasts. Inside ball one. There is one of the few times that Stargell's had a fastball tonight. He's seen a lot of breaking pitches hit his home run off a breaking pitch. That could be just to put something in the mind of Stargell. That came on a pitch. But Dempsey wanted it over the top. And Flanagan didn't put it there. Strike. One and one. This man can do to a low ball, Don, and you know it what Reggie Jackson can do to a low ball. Golf it right out of the ballpark. Oh, he's an excellent low ball hitter. He'll hit it nine miles. He won't just get it out of the ballpark. He might have hit it clean over everything. There you get the deuce. You get the change. Look out. Low. Oh, oh. I'll tell you that Dempsey's put in a night's work. This is what we meant when he said he was so great back there. The Baltimore infield way back. Coming inside. High pop left side. Belanger going out. Makes the catch. Baltimore wins it. Five four. What a tough victory, and what an augury for this World Series. Each team playing according to its pattern of the year. It's really incredible when you look at it. Baltimore holding together with its pitching ace all the way. And the Bucks chopping, 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 getting the great relief pitching just fell. Well, you really can't say enough, I don't think, for the gutty performance of Mike Flanagan. He stayed right there. He fought him tooth and nail, and he ends up on top. The line score, Baltimore 5-6-3, Pittsburgh 4-11-3, back after this message and a word from our local station. But in the ninth, manager Earl Weaver still sticks with his 23-game winners. The potential tying run, Dave Parker, stands at third. At the plate, it's that man again, Willie Stargell. With two outs, it comes down to strength against strength, and Flanagan wins. Belanger closes the book on game one. Jubilation and congratulations for weary Mike Flanagan, and the fans demand a curtain call. A fantastic ovation for the man who met all the challenges of the evening.